You're listening to the Work Cultured Podcast, where good companies keep good company. You are listening to or watching the Work Cultured Podcast. Today, we've got Evan Erdberg of Proximity Learning. Thanks for joining the show. That's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. In beautiful Austin, man. Yes, absolutely. So, yeah, sometimes we do these virtually. Sometimes people get to come up here in the studio and, and join us in person. And it's uh, always a little bit of a stronger energy, I think, when we're, when we're sitting here together. Uh, so you give me just a little bit of background. But what I understand is that you were a teaching uh, advisor or, or uh, evaluator, and you saw a lot of problematic things within the entire education system, some inequities, and outbirthed proximity mm -hmm. learning. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. So back in the day, um, as we go past 10, 12, almost 14 years ago, um, I worked in professional development for teachers as well as evaluation for teachers, and I worked with school districts to implement a system to build trust between the administrators and the teachers. So they mm -hmm. both understand the observation system, they're trained on it. Um, we continue to train administrators every month so that they stay proficient, so that teachers will trust what the principal is observing is correct, mm -hmm. um, listen to it, become better, and the principal knows the right way to actually observe a classroom to make sure um, what they're seeing is something that could enhance education. And so when we, put these systems into play, we would go train the staff. And we'd go into a high school, and there's supposed to be 300 teachers that are gonna get trained that day. And 250 would show up. Wow. And at the beginning, I just did not really think about it. I was like, well, maybe they're sick, mm -hmm. maybe teachers are home maternity leave, I, I really don't know. Um, I kept seeing that. As the year went on, my first year, uh, we would go into middle schools where there's supposed to be 100 kids and there's 80, or an elementary school with 30 teachers and there's 20. And um, you know, I went to a couple of districts in you know Odessa, Texas, where you know they're supposed to have 300 high school teachers and there's like 10. What? <laughs> yeah. Whoa. The rest are just long-term subs. Um, wow. And I kept seeing this. And back in the day, it was really in your urbans and your rurals. Yeah. Um, your suburbans were where all the teachers were because mm -hmm. they left the urbans and the, you know, rurals to go to the suburban where you have strong PTAs, mm -hmm. the kids behave, they have resources. Yeah. Um, and so I kept seeing this and in my purview, I always assumed everyone got access to education. Mm -hmm. No matter where you live or in America, you know, you get your core subjects, your electives, um, I was lucky enough to grow up in New Jersey um, in a great school district. So I assumed everyone had a similar experience. Yeah, yeah. Sure, surely the United States cares about education. <laughs> you think. <laughs> um, and we've come to realize that might yeah. not be true. Oof. And so I was learning about it firsthand um, in this job and seeing the inequities and seeing that the kids who actually do need the teachers the most were the ones not getting them. Yeah. Because let's say where I went to school, I needed math and I needed reading help um, when I was younger. What happened? My parents got me tutors. Mm -hmm. I had after school help. Yep. Um, when I was in the school, I was in a special class with great teachers. And, sure. You know, I was able to thrive even with a problem. Um, and these are the kids that don't get that. Yeah. You know, their parents can't advocate for them. The community right. doesn't have the people to do it. Um, they're the ones that need the best teachers in the classroom. Um, and so they were the ones that were not getting it. Yeah. And it really added to that whole circle of poverty. Yeah. Just inequity upon inequity. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so it was from that, that I decided to figure out, is there a way to solve this? Um, I was on the road a lot. And so I would get taught virtually back then it was Skype. Talk about a uh, technology that missed the boat. Um, <laughs> But uh, it was Skype, and uh, I learned um, a lot of new strategies and how to train people, how to talk with teachers and administrators, and 
for me, I was always a hands-on learner, so I needed someone to teach me, and it worked for me. And I was like, well, if this is working for someone like me. Why can't we find the teachers that are willing to teach mm -hmm. in these schools but not maybe willing to move there and use Skype or Adobe Connect and bring them in remotely? Mm -hmm. So I put together a business plan. I spoke to a couple of friends, um, and one of them was really invested in virtual instruction in Texas, and he uh, and I, him and I partnered, and we brought on investors, and the investors were like, well, invest, but you got to move to Austin. Uh -huh. And I was living in New York City at the time. And so uh, I decided to take a gamble. Yeah. It's I a, mean, it was a big, a big gamble. gamble. <laughs> yeah. um, I did not have kids then. So right. the yeah. risk uh, was for myself and for my um, wife-to-be. But uh, we decided to take the gamble and uh, leave New York City and move to Austin and see if we could make something about this. Yeah, about 10 years ago. Yeah. Wow. So that's wild. Tell me about the... Because I looked on LinkedIn, you guys have you know close to 400 employees just on LinkedIn. So I assume it's somewhere in that range, if not higher, in reality. Yeah. Yeah, we got about almost a thousand teachers that are all employees, wow. and we have about 120 corporate employees. Wow. So That's uh, incredible. A lot of people. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we'll talk about challenges and and everything else here in a sec. But tell, get, what, give me the journey. What's that timeline looked like? Has was there a big spike at any point or has it been a steady gradual growth i would say my first five years or at least the first three years i thought i made a mistake uh -oh. <laughs> um because think 10 years ago like right now virtual obstruction high-speed internet computers we take yeah. all that for for granted sure yeah you know the poorest person in america has access to that um 10 years ago uh Very that was good. not the case every school wasn't wired Right. You know, we were using Skype, you mm -hmm. know, and Adobe Connect, not the high quality Zoom. Um, and so when we started the company, we had to educate people on what we were doing. What is virtual instruction? Right. Yeah. Live instruction through the, through what is that? The web? The in inter <laughs> internet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. We had to educate. So when you educate people, they don't exactly buy right away because uh -huh. it's new tech, new, new way to do something yeah. in an industry that's done the same thing for 200 years. And so uh, it took a long time to get people to agree, even though they had a problem. And we had some early adopters, and we had to learn you know, what we didn't know. Mm -hmm. We made a lot of mistakes. And um, it really wasn't until probably year three where we got a contract with uh, Milwaukee Public Schools. To, they had recently change their law to require all their students to be required to take a world language. Interesting. So think about that. In Milwaukee, up until about seven years ago, you didn't have to take a world language. Wow. Even though to go to college, a world language is required. Right. So think about the challenge of being a student in an urban environment. And the teachers are already missing because their curriculum probably didn't even exist until... You're not, you're not even taking a world language, and you need that to get to college. Yeah. So you can't even get to college because your district won't provide you with the uh -huh. resources that you need. Um, so they didn't have world language teachers, so they hired us. Uh, they took a chance yeah. on us because before us, they were using asynchronous um, curriculum, and it wasn't working. Mm. Um, the teachers, kids need a teacher. Yeah. Uh, especially in the urban environments. Putting them in front of a computer with a click, click, learn just doesn't work. Right. And so they took a, they took a gamble because we were a small company. Yeah. And we did, they gave us a big contract and we did a fantastic job. And we're That's still amazing. with them. Oh, um, cool. And we've grown. And that gave us name brand yep. recognition. It gave us revenue to grow. Mm hmm um, and then we got Chicago, <laughs> Ooh. which was another big one, um, right down the street from them. And that again, you know, we were able to double the size of our company and with two counts, Yeah, you know, so by year four, I was able to hire more salespeople, invest in a marketing team and mm -hmm. go from just having, you know, six people working to make this. Well, now you work. also have proof of concept. You've got cash flow, So the investors are probably eager to, you know, pour more in, or if you needed mm -hmm. to raise another round, you, I'm sure you could. We did. Maybe you didn't have to, but <laughs> yeah, we we luckily I uh, raised a lot to start, and so we had money, but we were burning through money, and yeah. this allowed us to now start offset that and yep. to have that proof of concept, which is the most important thing, because 
after you go into a district and say hello in a sales meeting, the second question they ask is who else is doing this? Yeah, yeah. And so, who the heck are you? Do you have any clients? <laughs> and they're like, oh, Chicago and Milwaukee. We know those places and their references. I've heard of Chicago. Uh, <laughs> and so we started to, you know, grow in year five. Um, year four, we grew substantially. From year four on, we were growing at probably 30 to 40% a year. Year over year? Yeah, wow. until COVID hit. And then uh, that presented a lot of new challenges because all of our clients went home. Uh-huh. But luckily, our product is something that can continue at home. Yeah. And so uh, we doubled in size. Wow. Um, and then um, it doubled in size again. And so we went from pre-COVID, maybe 150 teachers to, you know, 600 teachers by the end of Oh, COVID. my goodness. And now up to, you know, almost 1,000. And so it just it did allow us to scale because what we did was even more relevant yeah. and COVID allowed people to norm to virtual instruction. That's yeah. what it did is people before COVID didn't believe in virtual instruction mm -hmm. um, or weren't um, involved or researching or looking into it because they didn't have to. Right. Now they had to and a lot of them realized you can do it online. Mm -hmm. And all the new money went into new infrastructures and computers yep. and everyone had Wi-Fi and mm -hmm. everyone understood virtual instruction should be an option. And yeah. So and really also just I mean game. just the name of it, virtual instruction, right? That it's at the forefront of our consciousness now. I mean, it wasn't really yeah. in the vocabulary of school district leaders or anything like that it, because it wasn't necessary. And now it's Everybody, everybody on the planet knows what that means. And it's not just an education, it's work. It's everything. It's everything. Right? Yeah. And so it normed it. It normed our entire community to virtual, which gave us an advantage because we we're one of the only companies that said, let's do virtual teachers. Most mm -hmm. companies out there focused on building high quality content, taking the teacher out, yeah. making like a SaaS product. Mm -hmm. um, so that um, that's a one time high cost, but then to provide that. To a student, it's really, really cheap. Yeah. And they make a lot of money. Um, with us, we always believe that teachers to be the most important part of education. Mm -hmm. And so we try to enhance um, the instructional materials those teachers have. We don't try to take the teacher out. We try to yeah. um, empower the teacher to be more successful. So um, it's funny because during COVID, people ask, did you just create this company? Did you what? Did you just create this company? Oh, yeah. Was this creating COVID? <laughs> yeah. And I was like, no, we've been figuring this out for, you know, six years before COVID. Which is a strong selling point too, right? Because a lot of fly-by-night started popping up to, oh, we can yeah. solve this, we can do this. And you're like, man, we've been doing this for years. Yeah. yeah. And, they, and, um, and they did a really poor job because yeah. they went through all the problems we went through when we started. And... We were past that. We understand what needs to be done for high quality instruction. Yep. Um, these companies are now just starting that process. Same yeah. with school districts. Most school districts failed in mm. virtual instruction. It's mm -hmm. why almost every kid in America is two to three years behind where they, they should actually be. Yep. Um, it's and it's not the fault of school districts. It's they never had to do it. Yep. But they were forced online and never trained their teachers and give them the resources. Mm -hmm. Teachers were worrying about their own kids at home with them as well as they're trying to teach. So. Yep. It was just unfortunate situation. Everyone's life got uprooted, uh, you know, and, and kids got a big brunt of it. Oh, They're yeah. Thankfully, very resilient, but they are behind a ton of them are. I mean, it's funny. It's, it's actually not funny. It's sad. But do you know how many kids were left back the first and second year during COVID you know, left? for summer school? Oh, no. Uh, zero. Think about that. Typically, 15 to 20 percent of the kids in the school district are eligible to be held back or have some sort of summer school help. Um, and that's to catch them up so yeah. that they're prepared for the following year and the teachers aren't in a place right. where they can't teach so these kids. So they just disappeared. That, that whole concept they just... Didn't hold, they held zero people back and didn't provide any service for these kids because they didn't show up, of course. Right. So two years of no remediation for the kids that needed it the most. Man. And they just pushed them ahead. Yeah. Oof. So to be a teacher now is a challenge. And that's why they're quitting is... Not because yep. they don't want to be there. It's they already had a challenging. It was career. already one of the hardest jobs, with, with the most underappreciated jobs in America, and now it's even harder. Exactly. Yeah. Is now they have this new problem, which is the kids in their class. Almost every one of them probably should have some sort of IEP. <laughs> sure. Everyone should probably be a special education student. Man. 
Well, it's got to feel good though. I mean, you get the impact you're making as a company and the fact that you're growing so fast, you're creating jobs, you're creating equity. Uh, but that's got to, that's got to hit the, the heartstrings for you. Yeah. <laughs> it's exciting. Cause you yeah. get to, you know, you get to do well by doing good. Yeah. And the stories that we get from our students that are excited about learning for the first time, because they didn't have a math teacher for three years yeah, and they actually right, realized yeah. they love math. Yeah. But they just didn't have a teacher to show them that. Or the teachers that maybe couldn't work um, full time at home. They're a recent mom or military family that had to move all the time and yep. couldn't have a stable job. They they love it. They found their pat or they gained their passion back. Mm -hmm. um, or the teacher who had quit and said they're out. They're not educating anymore, but they're going to give us one more try with PLI. Mm -hmm. And they love it. They're they're ecstatic. They can't wait to teach more. And they ask me, how can I move up in this company? You yeah. know, how can I continue to provide back to these students? And so, my first start of the company was for the students, but the teachers were impacting. Yeah. Um, so many of them, and they're so excited about it because we help them focus on why they became a teacher, which is the student. So in a public school, yeah. they have all these other responsibilities. Right. I was going to say, like, it, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but the responsibilities, their their workload and their focus, like, and the why of what they do is probably a lot more concise and really kind of what they want versus all the other stuff, painting your room before the school, <laughs> all that kind of thing, right? Like, yeah, if you were to ask a teacher, they actually spend maybe 40% of their time on a student. Yeah. The rest is bus duty, recess, um, you know, having to fill out paperwork, yeah. dealing with parents, dealing with other teachers, bureaucracy, yep. <laughs> um, their classes. Um, with us, they get to spend almost 100% of their time on their students. We clear yeah. out all the busy noise. We give them really impactful resources so they can also innovate when they teach mm -hmm. they we put them into peer groups where they get to work together and have a say wow. um i meet with we have 10 different groups in our community groups where teachers could join and then they meet with me once a month to go over everything they're hearing what they're working on their asks um so that they have a voice at the leadership table that's incredibly cool and they're all employees of yours right so you're you're a contract fee with a district and then yep. everything else is you are employing equipping and everything else. Yep. All those teachers are our employees. Wow. Um, and they could choose to work full time or part time. Most choose part time and we allow them flexibility to take advantage of the gig economy. They can work three hours a day. Uh, they can work 10 hours a day and make yeah. as much as they want. Um, they could also do tutoring when we have those, they could do asynchronous classes if they, if we have them to grade. Mm -hmm. Um, we allow them the flexibility to earn and to be a part of a student's life on their terms. Yeah. And that's exciting because when teachers leave, you know, we're losing someone who can impact so many people's lives mm -hmm. and it's hard to get someone to replace them because schools of education are down 35%. Yeah. Um, if we're able to save those people and bring them back into education, they might work for us for three or four years, but then they might actually go back into a school building. Mm -hmm. They won't completely like separate from education mm -hmm. and then it won't be too hard to come back. Yeah. You know, uh, we're the best thing for a school district or for them to have someone in person in the class who's highly qualified working with those kids. But if you can't find that person, having a teacher from proximity learning is your second best. Yeah. And we know that we want to be that. And we yeah. also want to encourage teachers to go back to the classroom. Right, right. <laughs> it's funny that you, you don't think of a company going, we are second best. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure that's not your headline, but it is a, a funny concept. <laughs> yeah, it's, and we know it is. We yeah. want what's best for the student. Right. Everything we do is what's best for the student. Yeah. And that's why school districts partner with us and stay with us for a year over year. Even though when they start with us, they might say, this is temporary. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is temporary. We're going to find that science teacher. And then three years later, they've got the same science teacher uh -huh. uh, for three years. And eventually they're like, you know what? We, we're probably not going to find that teacher. Yeah. But we know you're doing a great job and the kids are learning. So we're happy. Do you feel like, so, you know, again, we're, we, we're here. We talk about culture uh, and just the whole workplace. And I assume that you guys are pretty scattered all over the place. <laughs> is that? Oh, yes. Yeah. Our teachers work from home. Yeah. Um, I've got about 20 plus employees in the corporate offices here, but the other hundred are remote. Yeah. So, uh, culture is very important to us and very hard. Yeah. 
very hard. When I was grew up working, we were all in an office together. <laughs> and Coffee Talk was great because you got to put ideas through people. Mm -hmm. You got to meet people, lunch, went out to lunch with people. Or, you know, we had to be real thoughtful on how we engage our employees. And yep. it's two types. It's our teachers. How do we engage them? Right. Um, and make them feel like they're part of something greater. Because loneliness and mm. the feeling of being alone on an island can really force someone away from us. Yeah. And teachers tend to like groups and want to be together yeah. and want peer encouragement. And so we really focus, we have a whole team that actually focuses on bringing teachers together each week, gaining their input. Um, we even do lunch and learns and stuff like that. Yeah. We do quarterly professional development where we bring in speakers and we hire our speakers that are our teachers that are doing a great job to do professional development or oh, wow. create unique yeah. professional development workshops so we empower them every week we highlight a teacher and we say you're going to be highlighted for the whole senior team um and create it like a minute video on yourself so that wow. the senior team the whole corporate team could see it um and so we really try to celebrate our teachers and then with the corporate staff that's that's the tough one Is it? <laughs> um because the teachers are coming in expecting to work remote and they tend to either have a reason or just want to corporate employees it's hard to build a culture when you don't see each other mm -hmm. because you can't, it's hard to build a deep relationship yeah. you get to build a surface relationship but you're not going out to lunch mm -hmm. you're not talking to people um at you know the water cooler you're yeah. not um asking people how their weekend was every day you're yeah. not um, go into the holiday parties or the professional development workshops we do locally. It's, it's harder and you have to be more intentional. And, um, again, we've tasked a team to do a lot of that where we put, um, again, we, we, we form a lot of committees. Mm -hmm. I feel it's a great way for virtual employees to get together is committees where we have, you know, the community service committee. Um, we have the, curriculum committee we have the party planning committee <laughs> you know to put together how we're going to celebrate different events we have um other we have about six other committees and um it's a way to engage people um outside of their job also um this year we instituted vto uh volunteer time off oh okay nice. so every employee in the company gets five days that they can actually spend on top of their current yeah pay time off yeah. to go volunteer and we encourage uh, them to do it in groups as well. Yeah. So, uh, and then they're supposed to take pictures, send it in, and we uh -huh. celebrate it once a month um, to encourage employees to give back to their communities and do it in groups as well. So that's a new, a new thing we instituted at Proximity Learning. That's really great. So, I mean, you, you, you guys have a ton of intentionality and thoughtfulness in the culture, taking care of people, building community. Uh, you know, I'm sure, though, there's been some bumps along the road. Right. I mean, you guys have quadrupled in size in the last four years, it sounds like, mm -hmm. uh, at least tripled. And so as you look back anywhere on the journey, but specifically in, you know, since kind of early 2020 to now, as the figurehead of the company, as the CEO founder, what's a mistake that you know you made, you learned a ton from and you'll just never forget? I mean, where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> which year do we want to go into? Uh, yeah, I I'd be like, like which, have, week, which week do you want to focus on? <laughs> I feel like there's a book. I mean, that's the thing. <clears throat> when you're starting a company and growing a company, there's so many issues you face you've never seen before, yeah. and you just hope you make the right decision. And yeah. many times you do. Many times you have a learning experience. Mm -hmm. um, I would say um, a couple of the experiences I've had are one of the most um, meaningful ones I learned, um, was to not over invest in an expectation on what clients are going to do. So hmm. we had clients say that they were going to, um, implement a virtual school. We had about seven or eight clients uh, about two years ago say, we want you to power a virtual school. We had contracts. They, um, we staffed up. So we staffed up 113 full-time employees. Um, and then an unforeseen thing happened where um, the Republican governors in those states said, we will not allow school districts to use 
state funding for virtual programs. Ouch. And so those programs were in Texas, South Carolina, yeah. and a couple other states. And overnight, yeah. we lost a quarter of our business. Oh, my gosh. And um, I had been carrying empl these employees on full-time pay for oh, four months. Man. I lost that. And so, yeah, I mean, it's devastating all across the board from a corporate standpoint and, you know, payroll taxes and unemployment taxes, but also just the people that like thought they were coming in and then, oh, yeah. and for you as a leader going, man, you know, I was going to provide this whole life for employees as well as experience are going to give these kids and then just to have it pulled. It was our first time money. going into full-time teachers. It was our first time investing in this technology and in this new way to instruct students because most of our contracts were in classroom this was for home mm. and so what it taught me is before i invest you know a couple million dollars in a program yeah. i should probably um baby step that yeah um and there are other ways we could have approached it we just we were growing so fast Mm -hmm. We were doing such a great job at everything we did that when we made those decisions, it was that hubris that we could do no wrong yep. and that we're growing and we're okay. That allowed us to say, yeah, we'll make that investment. Yeah. We'll be okay. We'll this make will turn investment. to gold, of course, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> that's, and that's what we thought. And mm -hmm. you know, that was, that was a mistake that really hurt. It, yeah. it hurt because I had to let people go, which I was the first time I had to do something like that at, in that size. Yeah. Um, and that we had to go to our sales teams and figure out how to recoup that revenue. Yeah. And again, my core business was virtual staffing and putting teachers into schools. And we thought that we can go into another vertical, which is virtual schools, which is teaching students at home, um, and take what we learned and do and be successful in that vertical. And what I learned as well from that is I probably should focus this on what we do best. Yeah. We're growing really fast in our core business. Yeah, we should just invest and stay in our core business. Yeah, it's, it's really tempting. I mean, especially in your case, the word virtual is in it. I mean, that's what we do, right? So yeah, yeah. and, and it, you see the dollar signs and everything else. Um, and also, you just want to succeed. You want to be good at other things, and you want to have the confidence going into that. Um, yeah, it, that ma it made us think that we can do whatever we want and yeah. we'll be successful. And it's virtual. We got it. Now the curriculum's different as well. Special education's a whole nother level yeah. that when you now have a student in that program. So there were so many, so many roadblocks that we didn't see because yeah. you know, we were just confident that we could figure it out. That's brutal. But uh, as you said, you know, these things happen and you learn and you move forward. It sounds like you did more than recoup though. Yeah, we made it back. Uh, it just took long. It took yeah. it took about six months. Yeah. And our core business were able to cover it, mm -hmm. but we were still like way behind, and we had yeah. let people go, and we had to reshuffle and restaff, and a whole division had to be moved. Right. Um, and we had to rethink also when it came to renewals and growth. Um, we had big numbers behind virtual schools. And virtual schools really is not our future. Mm -hmm. And so we had to shift how we look at forecasting. Yeah. Um, and if anybody uh, has had investors, <laughs> um, they know forecasting is very important. And so yeah. if you're off, you know, a lot of times that leads to, you know, challenging conversations. You're right. Big time. Yeah. And sometimes even limited funds and. You had to go make all these other cuts that you never would have anticipated, and yeah, it can be. Yeah, brutal. we had to make cuts across the board mm -hmm. to different programs. Yeah. Um, because I had a much larger budget for much larger revenue, um, and it, it forced us to take a step back. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's shift into something more positive then. What are some of the biggest wins? Things that you just are super proud of, and when you think about it, it just gives you life. Uh, some I most favorite things that have happened is when we've, you know, instituted new programs like, um, where we were asked to do music classes this year mm. <laughs> and the kids would not have had any type of music class. And we went in and bam, there's music. Cool. Or, um, man, I remember we got the contract for Roswell, New Mexico. And, um, I wanted to go on the onboarding because it's Roswell. 
You know, I want to get abducted. <laughs> um, it's ground zero for alienation. Yeah. Uh, I've never seen Let's it. Go. <laughs> I was like, it's rock and roll, baby. Let's see what happens. I'm ready. Take me up to the mothership. So uh, I went to go, uh, you know, on the walkthrough with our team. And the high school in Roswell, New Mexico, was actually built back in the Cold War, the Cold War days. So they built it underground. What? So it's a bunker. So, so the kids don't even get fresh sunlight. It's, That's nuts. It's underground. So we go underground and we go into the classrooms. Uh, and they, they, they have not had math teachers in three years there. Wow. A high school um, has not had math teachers in three years. 80% of the kids are failing the math state test. And so we go into the classroom where our teacher is going to be streamed in. We meet the facilitator who will be the person in the class. And I see... Uh, about 20 textbooks on the wall. And I asked them, is that you know the textbook that we're going to be using? Um, could we get a teacher edition so we could give the teacher edition to our teacher? Mm -hmm. And they said, yes, those 20 books are um, the books you're using. We do not have a teacher edition, though. And those 20 books need to be shared amongst six periods. Yeah, those are, those are the 20 books. <laughs> That's no it. Yeah. 180 kids. Oh, my God. We'll share 20 books. And I was sitting there dumbfounded. Yeah. I'm like, how is this possible? Um, but, you know, we, our teacher built the class as she taught it. So mm -hmm. we, we bought the teacher edition book because we found out what book they were using. So we bought it and we gave it to our teacher and we worked with our learning team to build a course as she taught it online. Wow. And we came back six months later and we walk into the principal's office, and the principal literally stands up, starts crying, Ugh. and comes over to us. And she's like, thank you, thank you. Man. She's like, the kids are learning, they're loving it, the parents are not coming in here yelling and screaming at me every day. Yeah. She's oh. like, we have a solution. That's so good. And she's like, actually, she's like, the facilitator that we have in your class, um, she loves your teacher so much and what's happening <laughs> that she's literally telling the other teachers in the class yeah. <laughs> how to be a teacher. Wow. And we had to talk her down because she's not a teacher yet. Right, right. We want her to be one, <laughs> but um, she's learning so much from your teacher and That's so are so the kids good. that she's so excited about what's happening in that classroom Yeah. that, um, you know, she's letting everybody know. And the parents are excited and the kids are learning. And she's like, we, we have not had people this excited about math in years. And, you know, that was something that was yeah really special um another time something like that happened is we went into the mississippi delta um that is 100 percent african-american 100 percent basically free and reduced lunch mm -hmm. um and we walk in there and they hired us to do spanish math and ela mm -hmm. and again they had no textbooks no not, not even one no textbooks. Yikes. And so, again, dumbfounded. Right. That, um, I mean, it's not their fault. I mean, they're just completely under-resourced. So we build courses, we offer it, and we start getting letters from uh, kids, you know, sending to mm -hmm. our client success manager, like, thank you letters. Wow. Saying, we didn't think people cared about us. You oh. know, education, we thought was not a thing for us. Um, you know, a lot of the kids were like, we were just expecting to just sit there and be ba babysat all day. And they actually started to learn and enjoy it and click with the teacher. And, um, the classes started really, really changing the direction of from failure to mm -hmm. maybe they have a future. Yeah. And a lot of them, um, at the end of the class said, you're my mentor. I so excited. They like the teachers were even crying. It was it was a change because for Magical. years the expectation in those schools were they're not going to get an education. Mm -hmm. They typically would put 300 kids in an auditorium with one sub and call that a day. Oh my gosh. Um, so they, the kids started to realize maybe they did matter. Yeah. Maybe, you know, education is valuable. Maybe they could have a future. Um, that's something that a teacher like that we provide can do or any high quality teacher does. The, and the, the, the reach of that is so much bigger and broader than just they learned something new, right? I mean, the, you kept saying, like, they didn't think they mattered. And now they're being told they do. 
and they're, they're being shown this worth and this value that they hadn't felt from the systems and the, everything else. And, and that yeah, they're going to learn information and knowledge, obviously good, necessary, but just the life learning there, the, the life giving nature of that is incredible and very far reaching. Yeah, I mean, education is the one free thing that we provide in the country mm -hmm. that could define your future. Yep. And if they don't get, you know, high quality education, then they don't get the opportunity to succeed. Man. Um, education is the change maker. Yep. And so that's why, you know, at Proximity Learning, when we work in a school district, it's it's a big deal for us. And mm -hmm. our mission is to have a million kids in our program. Wow. So every week <laughs> we start the week off, the whole corporate team, you know, we, we talk about, you know, when are we going to have a million kids in our programs? We ask that question in our senior call that everyone's on. And we say, how many students are we at today? We're at 80,000, we're at 90,000, we're at 92,000. Mm -hmm. You know, we're literally tracking how many kids we have in our programs every day yeah. towards our goal. Yeah. And that's what we're fighting for is to get that those kids in our programs because that would be a million kids like right now that do not have access to education. Mm -hmm. And if you're following the marketplace, it's just getting worse and worse. You know, it's becoming a pandemic of education because yep. teachers are leaving and even the suburban districts. Yeah. Um, like even where I go to school in Austin, Texas, it's one of the highest performing elementary schools. They're having to do team teaching mm -hmm. because they're down teachers. Even it's suburban brutal. schools with yeah. strong PTAs are facing the shortages, which is what is new to the teacher shortage. Before it was just your urbans and rurals. Mm -hmm. Now it's everybody. Yeah, it, it is. An, it's a, an epidemic. Yeah. And so Terrible. that's what's exciting about working for proximity learning is you know you're making a difference everything yeah. e every time we sell a new contract it's changing a student's life mm -hmm. it's different than just a random widget right um it's actually you know when we go into that class it's not like they had a teacher it's not like they were learning something is they were not engaged in instruction yeah and they were being babysat or they were hoarded into an auditorium you know we change that that's incredible. Man, thank you so much for sharing all of this. So e despite like all of this amazing stuff, right? I mean, your employees, I'm sure have a culture where just the why they do what they do can keep them ticking. But I'm sure that you also still experience just people dysfunction, right? <laughs> uh, and so, so for the other leaders listening in who are feeling inspired, let's also make like, they're not alone, right? I, I, do you have these people problems? What are some of your challenges? Whew. <laughs> um, one of my good friends who's a CHR for a big firm once told me HR would be wonderful if you took the people out of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I remember when I started the company, we didn't even have a teacher handbook. Mm -hmm. It was just be cool. That was it. Just do, do the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, Doesn't now, scale, but it's a good message. <laughs> I was like, just do the right thing. Yeah. I'm like, just, it's virtual. Just be good, right? I mean, now that handbook is like 40 pages deep <laughs> with stuff that people have done. Um, same thing on the corporate side. Um, it's, it's tough. And I mean, we're in a new world where um, people want people or the employee now um, a lot of times thinks more about themselves than they do the, the company. Yeah. Um, I know when I was working, going through the system, um, I was working 80 hour weeks, mm -hmm. not because I was forced to, but because I wanted to get ahead. I wanted to get into this seat. Um, and that's not what everybody wants anymore. A lot of yeah. times people want work life balance and that's cool too. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's trying to figure out how do we create an environment for every type of employee? Mm -hmm. Like the ones that do want to drive hard, the ones that, you know, want work life balance. Um, and then creating the plans around that as well as, Post COVID, now people expect the opportunity to work from home and work mm -hmm. remote, and sure. you know that was a big change because um, we have really nice offices and we want our employees in, and um, you know we we institute a three day in office, two day off, mm -hmm. um, but that's even a challenge for some employees that got used to being at home. Yeah, and e even if they were five days a week in the office, even the new kind of privilege still feels almost like a slap in the face for some reason. It does. And, 
you know, uh, I know people think different things. I mean, my, my thought process is, um, you know, you should be in an office if you're hired to be in an office. And the reasoning I like to look at is there's so many benefits. Um, one, mm-hmm. you're able to build culture and build loyalty because you see the people every day. You get to talk to them outside of just work, um, which didn't happen when we were remote. <laughs> it was you ping someone because you had a question. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, not often did you ask, how was your breakfast? I mean, how was your weekend? Do anything special? Right. Um, also, Just the, the connective tissue stuff. Also, yeah. like, I've, I, I see it all the time in the office. One employee just has an idea and goes to the other employee, and they just talk about it. Mm-hmm. There's no having a ping. You probably wouldn't have pinged an instant message. Yeah. Um, but because the employee's right there, they go and talk it out, and now they have a solution. Yeah. And even my employees that are remote, when they come into the office, because uh, we bring them in a lot, um, and they work with the teams. They're like, oh, they're like, I wish I lived here sometimes. Yeah. Um, and we have employees moving to Austin for that reason. Wow. Um, is that they want to be part of the office because mm-hmm. they realize the energy is there, and um, they want to be near their colleagues, and they want to experience that that feeling of success, the feeling of camaraderie, the feeling of we're together. Yeah. And you know, you can do it online. But it's a lot easier to achieve when you're all together. Yeah, and it's like, and, I mean, you have kids, and, and so you know it's your job as a dad, especially as they get older and more independent, is to you know, provide the space for them, the structure where like you kind of have to force them into doing things they don't want to do that's good for them, and then they eventually learn it's good for them, and then so they do it on their own. But it's just this, this crazy dance, and you're, you're having to do that as an employer, right? Like... Yeah. It's going to be good for you if you come in the office. But then they're like, well, if you're making me do it, then I hate you. <laughs> and I also think of new employees. Like a big part of being a new employee is you're shadowing someone else. You're asking questions. You're seeing how the office mm-hmm. works. It makes you feel like part of something. If you're remote, it's hard for that yeah. to happen. You know, because you have to be scheduled into webinars with everybody all the time. And mm-hmm. you have a lot of free time and you might not know what to do with it because you don't know what your tasks are yet. Yep. As opposed to being in the office and, you know, shadowing people and what they're doing. It's it's training new employees is a lot harder in yeah. a remote world than it is if they're in the in the office. For sure. And it's, I mean, you know, to hear you saying that who has built a business around being having a strong virtual platform I mean, you're even saying hey we're second best option for the kids and so you know there, there is something more effective and powerful about that in-person uh, dynamic yeah, and, i mean it, it depends on the company too i mean the type of you know if, if you're just a bunch of engineers and that's all you are then maybe you don't need as much collab time maybe you do it just i think it depends and you know yeah, it's, I mean, time will tell mm-hmm. what, what COVID will do to, you know, the work, the worker, the, the companies, the office life. Yep. Um, I do think we do a great job with our remote employees and make them feel valued and mm-hmm. heard. Um, and that's important because in today's world, you're looking for the best employee no matter where they yeah. are. Yeah. But I do value having employees nearby that I could really work with. Yeah, yeah. And this has all been really, really good. Um, in the interest of time, we'll, we'll kind of hit the last segment here, um, which is just a quick fire. So I'm just going to say, you know, five this or that's, and you tell me which one comes to mind for you. It's just our fun way of taking the serious, the challenges, the successes, and like, all right, how do we transition? Let's just have some fun and then uh, end on a high energy note. Uh, I will actually, you know, before we do that, plugs. Obviously, proximity learning. You would plug, but isn't it, what else comes to mind? Like, what would you, what do you want to say about the company or any other project you're working on life philosophy <laughs> that you want to plug? Um, well, obviously proximity learning yep. for school districts that can't find a teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's where it's at. Um, some of the things we are working on that are unique. Uh, we, we are investing heavily in international employees. Mm. Um, we've got over 30 corporate employees that work in the Philippines and Lebanon Wow. Uh, we're also investing in international teachers, and we're getting them certified here in the country, like former J ones. Um, so we're we're super cool. We're expanding out our workforce, uh, domestic to also bring in, you know, people from all over the world, which yeah. is really fun. And because some of these people are so dynamic, come with interesting stories, and yeah. 
um, they're on our team. So we have marketing people, we have uh, product people, and they work as part of the team with our mm -hmm. core team. And they have all different um, types of people on the same team from all over the world yeah. with different perspectives and ideas. And I think that's really going to help yeah, us Yeah, and their be perspective, their experience of school and education is probably utterly different than the rest of your employee set. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that's really cool about what we do is we're very pro professional development and growing our employees. Mm -hmm. And we have a whole team that's dedicated to um, creating professional development opportunities for our corporate employees. Every quarter we do a different focus, whether it's community, communication, leadership, um, and then we build professional development around it and we build out communities for people to work in together. Yeah. So um, we feel like the best way to grow is to invest in your team mm -hmm. and give them the ability to grow with you. Yeah. As opposed to saying, well, as a company we grew, but the employee didn't, so we need to find someone new. Yeah. Um, I'd rather help grow that employee um, as the company grows so that together we can continue to work as a group. It's the better investment for sure. I mean, not for culture, for even just monetarily, right? I mean, we all know the stats. We see the stats on how much it costs to lose an employee and have to replace them. Yeah, I love that you're actually investing in that way in the existing yeah. employee. That's great. We invest heavily in our employees because they're the future of where we go mm -hmm. and, and the ideas and the ways in which we manage. And so we want them to grow with us. Yeah. Um, and then I would say, Outside that, it's uh, trying to predict, you know, what the future of education is going to look like with new curriculum tools yeah. and dynamic curriculum, scripted lessons and AI. <laughs> we are investing in chat uh, GPT <laughs> yeah, I bet. Um, to help us with writing lessons as mm -hmm. well as I would love to figure out a way for chat GPT to be the tutor in between our teacher sessions. Mm -hmm. So let's say someone's in chemistry and um, they're out of class and they have a question about chemistry. They could just go to our um, virtual tutor that's yeah. a chat GPT bot and ask questions and get answers. Yeah. You um, have to train it to, to guide instead of just give the answers though, right? Like, that's I it. That's it's one of the challenges. Figuring out how to focus it, yeah. the answers properly. Uh -huh. But we'd love to figure out how to give students more access to knowledge using the AI. Yeah. That's fantastic. Glad I didn't forget the plug section because that's good stuff. Now we'll hit the quick fire and sure. then and then say sayonara. All right. First one's easy. Salt or pepper? Pepper. <laughs> Hard copy or audiobook? Both. Yeah? I okay. listen and I read a book every once a month and I listen to at least one audiobook a month. Okay. Well then um fiction or nonfiction? Um usually I'm reading a hard copy book that's a business book. Okay. And then the audiobook, if I finish my business audiobook, I then allow myself to listen to a fiction book. Nice, nice. I'm going off script here, but uh, Project Hail Mary, I think is the best audiobook ever made. It's the same author as uh, uh, the Matt Damon movie w that was on Mars. What was that called? Oh, Mission to Mars, Mission um, where he got left there. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Same author, but it's just the, it's the best audiobook ever. Project Hail Mary, you got to. Uh, okay, car or truck? Truck. All right. I saw you pull up. I already knew. <laughs> uh, country or city, as in rural or urban? The city. Yeah. Uh, last one, coffee or energy drink? Man, uh, coffee. Yeah, okay. I've been, I'll, I'll, on weekends, I usually do the energy drinks, but do <laughs> during the work day, it's usually coffee. Yeah, it's a little bit easier to just kind of sip on and keep that high going, right? Yeah, especially the nitrogen coffee. Oh, oh yeah. It's so smooth. That stuff's good. It's addicting, but it's, yep. it's, it's very good. Yep. And good when it's hot outside, too, because you can nitro. And that's Austin, brew. where we it get is. sun 300 days of the year. That's so. right. That's right. So that's why I'm all about that cold brew. Yeah. Man, Evan Erdberg of Proximity Learning. Excellent interview. Amazing things to say about education, about your company, the growth, the culture. Thank you so much for everything. It was a pleasure being here. All right. Well, this is the Work Cultured Podcast, and we are signing off. Bye for now. Thank you.